Hi, I'm Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Alex Gamble. It's March 14, 2017. We're at the Nicholson Library. And Alex, we always like to start by asking people, why wine? It was kind of a backwards entry to it. I got interested in wine uh, in the mid-80s. I got married young, had kids young, didn't go to clubs, didn't go to discos, um, but went to wine stores in my, near my office in Washington, D.C. and would bring bo interesting bottles home, and this was way before internet or even faxes. And the woman who had the store would, every month had a wonderful newsletter and she actually wrote well and would import wine on her own. And it was kind of one of those things you almost look, you look forward to almost when you're a 15 year old want to sneak inside the pages of Playboy. When you, that was in the old days when, when, when actually we actually saw something. And the newsletter was wonderful because she had all kinds of interesting wines from all over the world. Um, interesting breads she brought down from Hoboken, New Jersey, olive oils, panelli, things of that nature. And this was way before Whole Foods. And, and at sure. that point, your, your only real gourmet stores were, were kosher stores, maybe a Greek store, maybe an Italian store. Um, again, this was 30 years ago now, practically. And so um, it was that kind of environment that got me interested in it. And there were a lot of interesting people who came into the store. It was more like a salon than a uh, typical um, store you find today. And so we talked about wine and that I got interested in it more and more. So was there something, what drew you to France in particular? It was more, the idea was to take a year off with my wife and two kids when they were young and us to do a sabbatical in our early 30s. Um, my business partner taking a year off, it was my turn to take a year off and um, we, it really was, I never really been, spent any time in Europe. I don't think I'd been to Europe until I went there in March of 92. And my wife and I were thinking about, you know, can we kind of poke around and find something to do in the wine business? And at that time, um, through this wine store, we met this American woman, Becky Wasserman, who's a wonderful exporter and has really helped develop the, um, the small domains in Burgundy over the last now 40 years. And she needed some help with the business. This was in March of 92. And after a couple of bottles of champagne, some cheese and some bread, she said, why don't you come over and help us out? And we said, sure. And so we arrived a year later with our eight and 10 year old in tow. Was there something about uh, French wine in particular that drew you in? Or was it more about France itself? I think it was more about living in Europe. Um, the wine store actually was a big importer of Ital Italian wines. And so if you look at the logic, we probably had more of a, it was more logical for us to be in Italy. The woman who owned the store, her father had retired to Florence and was bird dogging wine for them. Um, my wife uh, was, start, she already spoke French, she started taking Italian lessons. So we really thought we were going to have been Italy. I mean, that was the logic of it. And we ended up just by kind of, I think, the, the stars were aligned and we ended up in France and in Burgundy. So take me through how you got from that to owning your own vineyard in France. 20 years. <laughs> so I worked with Becky uh, in the export business, helped run her business and helped her recapitalize the business for about three years from 93 to the fall of 96. And then from 96 to 97, uh, as I was turning 40, I went to the wine school. They have a one-year adult winemaking program in Bone, primarily for young adults who are in the midst of career changes sure. um, uh, or coming back to take over family domains. And as I explained earlier, it's really the general manager's kind of operation. You take chemistry, you take biology, you take enology, a lot of business classes, accounting, I mean, all that I already did because I was, had been in business my whole life. But you know, trying to pass chemistry when you're 40 years old in French, sure. Little, little, it's a bit of a challenge, you know, trying to learn the, and I spoke okay French, but as my college roommate says, Alec, I went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, says, Alec, you still speak in French with that redneck North Carolina <laughs> accent? I go, sure am. <laughs> But you know, to learn those technical words, it takes it took time, mm -hmm. and that was a real challenge. Um, you know, the course is very; um, it's a solid winemaking course, and what it does, it teaches you just enough to be dangerous, hmm. so you know where to go to get 
um, specialist information. So that's why in, I think it's important to remember virtually all, in, in, yeah, even now, virtually all really great domains in Burgundy are small family farms, albeit with incredibly valuable, um, um, expensive real estate. Mm -hmm. But these are small family businesses, and so you have to do everything from driving the tractor, knowing how to get the tractor fixed, um, all these kinds of things. You may not be doing it yourself, but you've got to know about it to, to manage it. I mean, you, you don't have just different specialists because they aren't big enough. The, the domains aren't big enough. So it was a good program and did that. And then in the summer of 97, started the business from scratch, a, a classic entrepreneurial story. How were you able to find land to start your business when you were purchasing? I know that most of the, most of the vineyard land is passed down. So how was how did you find land available to start? Well, really, the first first eight years, and actually first almost first ten years, was primarily buying as a negotiant, okay. um, which I know now is is much more prevalent here in in um, Oregon. Um, but the traditional way in Burgundy is to buy wine, what they call en vrac, in bulk, in the barrel. Okay. That has just either just been fermented or perhaps gone through the malolactic fermentation. And um, that has always been the role of the negotiant, the big houses in bone. And I think it's important to realize that um, you know, up until about Second World War, really in the early 50s, that's when the, the, the next real wave of s small domains were happening. But even then, virtually 90% of the wine in Burgundy was negotiant wine. Um, only with the first real oil crisis in the early 70s did a lot of small domains that used to sell to negotiant start doing a lot of bottling. That was hmm. the last, and because the price of the wine had gotten so low, um, because of the economy, the oil, all kinds of things, um, people started putting more and more wine in bottle. So in the scheme of things, domain bottling in Burgundy is a relatively new occurrence. So, but, so when I started, you could still find a lot of very good wine, well-made wine and great appellations in bulk. And my goal was, I, I explained earlier to some of the, the students, you have basically, you know, the big negotiants, what I call the, the elephants and some of the sm medium-sized ones, I call the rhinos, and then me and basically one or two others 20 years ago were the ants. <laughs> and there are lots of great crumbs that fall down. Mm -hmm. Because if a negotiant wants to make, say, 100, 100 barrels, say, 2,500 cases of a Merceau or a Von Romanet or a Jevre Chambertin, you figure 20 barrels are going to be great, 60 barrels are going to be average, and 20 barrels are going to be bad. The soup putting together is a pretty good bottle. Not a great bottle, but a pretty good bottle. My goal was to get four, five, six of those best 20. Basically, um, um, uh, uh, cherry pick the best wines. And I was able to do that really up and through for the first 10 years those things were available in that time I started buying more and more grapes within a year or two was we were actually vinifying more than buying in bulk mm -hmm. but it was always hard to find good grapes at good red grapes good Pinot Noir grapes it was easy to get the, the white grapes so then in 2005 bought our first little bit of vineyard some basic Bourgogne very inexpensive and then in 08, we bought our first really good vineyards, some Pliny Marche and some Chassagne. And it was primarily based on relationships with the local land lawyers or notaires, not notary publics, but notaires, and um, knowing a lot of people um, and keeping my mouth shut. And <laughs> when I say I'm going to do something, I, I follow through on it. And then we bought a little bit. Then the next, we bought the Batar Marche, the Grand Cru, and some more Pulini in 2011 and then two years ago at this time we settled on another approximately eight hectares so another 20 acres so now we have 30 acres and we farm everything bio biodynamically so going back for just a second you talked about trying to pick out kind of pick and choose some of your the best barrels of wine mm -hmm. how are you as a ant as you say able to do that well you have th there are there are Primarily what you had and still have are courtiers or brokers who, who work between the negotiants and the small producers. Okay. Most of these 
many of these contracts are very long term with some of the bigger houses. What you have are also a lot of smaller vigneron, perhaps people who are just getting started, who needed to sell a handful of barrels off for cash flow. And that's what I did a lot of. A lot of these smaller producers who were putting some in bottle themselves needed the cash. Um, many of these were friends of friends. I'd go see winemaking friends. I said, I know you, you don't have any wine to sell. You put everything in bottle. Who do you know who's up and coming, who's doing a good job that I could talk to? And they say, oh, go, so, go so see so-and-so. Tell them I sent you. <laughs> and because they sent me, they have confidence in that person's recommendation that you're always going to pay, do the right thing, and make good wine. And that's how a lot of it happened, word of mouth. And, and, and now many of these people have been my friends for 20 years. Sure. So you talked about starting your vineyards, and you and, and um, do you have a what you call like a, a vineyard philosophy? I think with that's a good question. Vineyard philosophy. Um, I believe in the idea of terroir. Okay, and this is a very overused and misabused <laughs> word. I like the word character. I think vineyards and great vineyards have real character. So the question is, is can we express that character? How does one express that character? The first thing is through really good viticulture. Um, healthy soil, healthy plants. Um, reasonable yields, not too low, not too high. Mm -hmm. I don't uh, uh, attest to that it has to be super low. With red, yes, but white, no. Sure. Um, and, th and picking at the right time. So that's kind of the basics. Um, there are a million ways one person's being holistic with the vines is another person's high, high dose chemicals. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, we can have dissertations on you know, what is natural, what's organic. Um, but I think the main thing is what we, we've tried to do is be as natural as possible. We are certified bio, um, which is basically organic. We're also too, we're pretty much biodynamic. Um, I'd say we're biodynamic soft, <laughs> um, but we're definitely we're certified bio. But being certified bio is not that big of a deal. Basically, it means no herbicides and no pesticides mm -hmm. and no chemical you know, kind of agents, no systemic treatments. That's not a big deal. Your problem is, is the actual application of the bio system. And then you need a real, you, need a, you really have to do everything from A to Z. You can't be, it's like being a bit pregnant. You're either fully pregnant or you're not. <laughs> and that's kind of if you're going to be bio or organic. You've got to do everything from beginning to end because it's mm -hmm. very detail oriented. So if you start in the vines being bio, you're going to harvest it bio. You're going to treat the vines, you're going to treat the grapes in a certain way, and you're going to make your wine a certain way. So it's the totality. Mm -hmm. I think that's what a lot of people miss, mm -hmm. is what's important. Because, and if you do all those little, all those, let's say 100 things, no one of those 100 things is difficult. What's difficult is to make sure you don't make a mistake along those 100 sure. things. Then making wine is easy. I mean, I remember one of the last classes we took and the one so it was the maladie de vin, okay, wine sicknesses. And they had a list of about 20 things going down of, of variables and 20 variables across the trump, and you had the, the boxes, and you had to say what you're gonna do. And I thought to myself, Jesus, Joseph, Mary, mother of God, how are you gonna, so many things can go wrong. It's a bit like when you, when you go take Lamaze classes for birthing classes and you learn about everything that can go wrong. You say, I don't want to know. Just give me, you know, give me the baby. Like when our mothers had us, <laughs> my mother had me. You know, they, 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 they gave my mother gas and we wake up. They wake up and we're in third grade. <laughs> so it, it's, again, it's a little bit too much knowledge. Sure. But what you do learn is that those problems occur because you haven't done the things beforehand correctly. So the point is, is don't, don't have sick wines. No, do everything correctly beforehand, and you usually, even a dodo can make pretty good wine. Now, to make great wine, you've got to do each one of those little things perfectly, and then learn within the context of the vintage, um, you know, how to tweak it. And that's, unfortunately, that's experience. Mm -hmm. Sure. Both unfortunate and fortunately, because you can't teach it. Sure. 
is uh, the bio, is it common in, in Burgundy? More and more, more and more. Um, uh, I would say, this is, that's a, perhaps as much as 20% and probably 50% are what I would call bio light. Okay. Who really aren't doing continuous systemic stuff and applying treatments and all that. Um, that's the big change since I've got to in the last 25 years. You went from having soils that were unbalanced, that had way too much potassium and all that, to now, quite frankly, are, that need potassium, <laughs> need nitrogen, um, but they're, and so we have to apply that with composts and with um, uh, 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 chicken excrement to, to have the balanced grapes. And that's a whole different, we can talk hours about that, <laughs> what's ha happened. I mean, it's been great, it's great that we have healthy soils, that we are green. And we were talking about this earlier, you know, so you're green and we're, it's, all, and it's all sustainable, all these cutie patootie words that people use and no, that everyone throws around, they know what they mean. But the reality is in 2012 and in 2016, all right, so we're bio, but we had to treat probably eight to, 18 to 20 times, eight times more than if we had been systemic. How much more fossil fuel do we burn? Right. Sure. How much more? How much more um, pollutants do we put in, in 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 the environment? So it's not a zero sum game. And and I said this earlier this morning. Everybody wants to make things simple, and it's not simple. You know, you, you mean, I, 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 when I hear things on the t television, it drives me crazy. Both the left and the right. It's not simple. It's complex. It's it, 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 there are choices that have to be made. We try to do the best we can, but nobody's perfect. Sure, nobody's perfect. Is uh, are the French consumers? Is that is it being driven by consumers? Is there a consumer demand for more sustainable wine? People talk about it. People don't want to pay for it. <laughs> sure. Okay. At the end of the day, you know how many are, are you? Are is someone willing to pay two dollars, three dollars more for a bottle of wine because it's sustainable? Not. People will buy good wine. Um, again, I don't think the market is pretty small. A handful of of of, of bars that are, that are focused on that and all that, but um, it doesn't it, it doesn't drive the market. Okay. I mean, in the scheme of things, it's a tiny amount, and we can't get and we don't sell the wine expensively enough for the work we do for it. So that's the problem. It's a slippery slope. Sure. Do you have a favorite wine to make? What the Burgundians always says, like saying you have a favorite child. Yeah. Um, Is there one that surprised you? There's there, there are wines that surprise me every year. Um, that's what's interesting. I mean, wines are like, and I'm not going to totally answer your question because it's um, I don't I don't know if I have one or not. <laughs> I mean, if I could drink for, if I could drink wine all the time, it would be Chambol. For the reds and for the whites, probably our Pulini or Santo Ban. But um, what, what's interesting is that every year the wines act. What's interesting is certain vineyards begin to have certain personalities, and they act the same year in and year out. And at a certain point during the, the wines barrel aging or elevage. And when you say ele, eleve means to raise, like raising a child. Mm -hmm. Elevage of cows and, and, and basically, you know, it, it, it's chicken. So you're eleveur you're, and, you're, you, and you're in it like a student, eleve, um, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're ra, you're ra étudiant and you're raising that wine like a child. So at a certain point, it's gonna be a two-year-old cuss. <laughs> and sometimes, like my son was a tough two-year-old, but my daughter was a great two-year-old, but my daughter, my daughter was a terrible three-year-old. Then you got 13-year-old girls, sorry, in the background, but you two will be a mother someday. And then you got 15-year-old boys that are dumb as do doornails, sweet but dumb as doornails. And they get to college, and they're still dumb as doornails, and the girls are smart. And finally they catch up. That's a wine at the level we're doing is like that. Now, I gotta be very specific about it. 
most wine is not what we do. I mean, we're the, and what most wine made in Oregon, the fine wines in Oregon, remember, I think the industry defines a super premium wine at over $20. So the average price of wine in France is three and a half euros a bottle. The average price in the United States is about five bucks. Mm -hmm. If you count in all the jug wine and average it down. So I think we're talking about a very, very small amount. And that's, and that's very, so it's a, what we do, making fine wine. We is the royal we, mm -hmm. making the Oregonians, the Californians, the, the, the French, and all of, you know, the fine wines is a very small amount. And so as a result, we look at those wines as individuals and they have a personality that tends to repeat itself if it comes from the same vineyard. That's interesting. I find that fascinating. And they have certain characteristics. There are periods of time where the wines are just awful and then all of a sudden, um, or vintage can be very, very difficult, but you'll see glimpses of it during its élevage where it's brilliant and you go, okay, that wine in about six years is gonna be fantastic. The problem is you gotta sell that stuff in between and that's the hard part when you're making wine like this, because it's not, it's not, it's not a, um, a standardized product. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, that, and, there, and that's a two different businesses. Both are equally um, uh, uh, just. It's not a question of, 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 of the, um, question of morality, it's a question of choice and marketing. Sure. So you talked about this a little bit earlier, but I'm sort of curious, in the 25 or so years you've been in Burgundy, how have you seen it change? Well, the first thing, again, is what I said about the land and, 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 and treatment of the soil. That's probably the biggest change, um, going from something very ungreen to green in, in very general terms. And that's the most positive thing. Um, the most difficult thing, well, when, we got, when I got there 25 years ago, the big mantra was reduce yields, reduce yields, get more concentration, get more concentration. We have done that with a vengeance, and now we don't have enough grapes. Hmm. Um, they're f from a variety of reasons, um, climactic, um, viral, um, funguses, um, three years in a row of hail, <laughs> last year frost, losing 80% of most of my, I mean, just my, anybody in the Cote de Bone lost 80%. Um, this is what's the real challenge right now is that um, our cost of production is much, much higher than the, than the yields we're getting. And so most of us are operating um, at a deficit. Um, and thank God, interest rates are so low, or still very low in, 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 in Europe, 1%. And it's political. Uh, part of it I mean, is farming. And sure. so the politicians are going to protect the farmers, which is good. Um, but that's the big change. And I don't know. It, I, well, it's going to take a generation to get it to come back. Where everyone's, I've never seen so many vineyards being replanted, mm -hmm. uh, both in part and in whole. Mm -hmm. uh, the amount of composts going down, um, all I mean, we 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 we've got to basically get the vines back on steroids, or at least get healthy again. They were on steroids. It's a better way to put it. They were on steroids. We got them off steroids, and now they're a bit too skinny. They have no energy. We got to get the, some vines, the energy back. Sure. So one thing we've always heard when we talk to Oregon wine folks who have experience in Burgundy or in France in general is the amount of regulation from the government. I'm curious, and, and how appreciative they are, they don't have to deal with it here. I'm curious your thoughts on how that has affected you. I was talking earlier to some of the students. Um, the answer is yes. There are a <laughs> lot of regulations. And when you're in France, you have to accept the system, you have to look at it as a holistic system. You can't pick and choose like a Chinese menu. And if you do that and accept that, you learn how to work within those constraints. You can be very creative, but then it's more, it's, but it's nuanced. It's very much, it's, it's fine tuning within these general framework. Um, I mentioned to some of you, I'm making some wine down in California. Um, and people say, why not in Oregon? Well, I, I, <laughs> I've lived in, in cold, wet weather for 25 <laughs> years. Sorry, Oregon. <laughs> but I need to get some sunshine. Santa Barbara's pretty nice. 
But there, it's the same as here. And this is why my, 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 my French colleagues are here. You can do whatever you want. You can see a vineyard, and you look at a site, you look at the soil, you dig a hole, you go, that soil looks interesting. We can plant 15, 20, 30 acres. I mean, the most expensive vineyards here or, or, or California are the price of our cheapest in Burgundy that we can't sell for more than 10 euros a bottle. The math doesn't work. Sure. So the sky is the limit when you come to the United States. It's great. I mean, it's, you know, that's what that, it was asked earlier by some of the kids, that's what I miss is that creativity. You can do, everything is possible mm -hmm. in the United States. There's that can-do um, positive atmosphere that I do miss, or that, but I've learned to just kind of deal with. And so um, it, it, it's a choice, um, but it's, um, uh, uh, you know, you, you can't have it both ways in France. It's a little bit easier for me because I can see opportunities other people don't. And I, and I say, instead of, and the, the French term of, of why not, pourquoi pas, basically means no way. If we say, here's an idea, and they go, why not? That means, let's give it a try. In France, it means, no way. <laughs> and that's what you get a lot of. And, but you'll learn, you'll learn how not to be too disappointed. After 25 years, I'm, I've, you know, I've more than accepted it and enjoy it. And I laugh about it, because sometimes I want to <laughs> sure. wring some necks. Sure. sure. <laughs> Uh, so you're here today, your talk tonight is about marketing internationally, especially international marketing and, and distribution. So I'm curious, you don't make that much wine in terms of quantity, but you are you distribute to a lot of different places, including mm -hmm. here. So talk a little bit about your why, why you choose to, why you chose to distribute that way and a little bit about just distribution in the United States in particular. Well, Burgundy has always been an export product. Um, uh, since the Roman times, Burgundy was the crossroads of Europe. Um, it's where the several valleys come together. Um, you see that now with the auto routes come through there, the train, the train. It, it's just a natural route, just like the Transcontinental Railroad and the highway systems in the U.S. follow the same route. It's the easy, so it, it's a natural route. Um, Burgundy has also been, has always been expensive vis-a-vis -vis other wines in France. And so to sell those wines, they were exported. Um, a lot early on to Brussels, to the north of France, to England. Um, and then when the bottling started, um, just before the war and after the war, a lot to the United States and other parts of, of the world. So um, for us to survive, unless you're going to sell to Negociant like they used to, you have to put it in bottle and sell it at a premium. Um, and so we sell, Alex Gamble wines, we sell around 25, 30% in France, which is pretty good. Um, primarily to restaurants and a few retail outlets. Very little direct to consumer. Um, it's not that big of a thing in, in France. And also because again, the, the French don't spend a lot of money on wine. Mm -hmm. They drink their local inexpensive wine because people don't have the money. They don't have the salaries. So they don't have the disposable income. In addition, we have the VAT tax that adds 20% on onto everything. So it's, it's, a, it's a different, so when you have this expensive product, Burgundy has to be exported. So we sell about 45-ish percent, 40, 45 in the United States, three or four percent in, in the UK. I'd like to sell more, but it's like trying to sell in New York. Everybody wants to sell in London, such a big market. Sure. Um, we do very well in Japan and now in Korea, mm -hmm. a bit in Australia and in um, New Zealand, and then other odds and end countries. So what is, uh was it difficult to break into the United States? Was it difficult to, you said New York, was it difficult to break into certain markets? Difficult to find any distributor, any distribution. Really? Um, there's too much wine. There are too many choices. And there are too few good distributors that um, understand fine wine and want to sell fine wine. And I, don't th and I don't think they would disagree with me. What you have are now a lot of the big houses that have zillions of dollars and will pay you your bills. You'll get paid. But it's hard for them to sell it because 
they could easily be selling paper napkins or plastic forks or, or uh, distributing um, chickens, okay? It's, and it's the nature, it's, it's, it's human nature. If you're a salesman, and I, if I'm a salesman and I can sell 50 cases of two buck chuck, probably get in trouble for saying that, we, okay? It's on a lot of interviews. Two buck chuck comes up a lot, okay. so it's fine. Or yellow tail, <laughs> and put it on the floor of, of a store and go through 50 cases a week or 50 cases a month and get my commissions. Or I have 50 cases total of Alex Gamble wines, 10 different wines, one case of this, three cases of that, and I've got to explain what it is. Sure. It's human nature. It makes sense. So the market for fine wine in general, the highest part, and then Burgundy in particular, because it'd be one thing if it was just Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. We've got who knows how many appellations, which is wonderful, and the, and the people who are Burgundy freaks love that. But if you're not, if, if, if you don't know the language of Burgundy and what it means, you're lost, and then I do these I do these lectures and talk. People come for tastings, and I start trying to explain things, and you can see people's eyes glazing over, and they they basically are telling me, you know, can you give me a glass of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and quit killing me with the details? <laughs> sure. So that's the thing. So you know, you have a handful of people where you're li who have people who've really drunk the Kool Aid. They get it. They know more about it than us. And then there's everybody else. You're constantly trying to educate and bring new people in because most of the ones who've already drunk the Kool-Aid are dead and dying and their cellars are full. They're 65 years old. Their cellars are full. So how do you do that? That's the problem. That's, that's, the, that's in, and I've been last day or two talking to my friends here in Oregon. I mean, they, they have the same problems. Yeah. And you have all these now small virtual wineries and small thousand uh, case operations. I mean, how do you get traction? You go door to door. It's guerrilla marketing. I mean, you have to go and really create the market for the distributor because what you need is somebody to find you to deliver it in a truck based on the laws. Sure. It, it's not an easy business, not an easy profession we've chosen to make wine and sell it in the United States. That's why I don't want to sell more than 40% in the United States. I don't want to push on the string. Sure. Because it becomes a marginal game. You might get you get, might get somebody to sell more of your wine, but you're never going to get paid. Because the folks who have the passion and understand it and can make good placements usually don't have the money <laughs> to pay you or pay you in a timely fashion. <laughs> and I'm too old to, to wait around for money sure. <laughs> at this point. <laughs> So you, you, you brought up Oregon, and I'd like to kind of shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about the Oregon industry. Mm -hmm. um, first, I'd just love to hear your, your impressions of the Oregon wine industry. Well, I've been coming here, my first time here was in 1994. Um, I've been in Burgundy for a year. I came here with three or four winemakers from Burgundy uh, for the IPNC. And I've been to the IPNC now five times, six times, um, every few years, mm -hmm. and you know, I've got a lot of friends here. And what I said to my friends back then, and I say now, I think the Oregon industry needs to find its own voice. Um, and I think it will. Um, I think some people have found their voices, um, uh, and I think other people are still trying and it takes a long time. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time. Um, and you can make really good Pinot Noir and Chardonnay here. It's not gonna be like Burgundy. Um, it shouldn't be like Burgundy. It needs to get its own expression. Sure. And um, there are a handful of people who I think are getting that, but they've been at it a long, long time. Well, actually, long by, Bur by, or by Oregon, Oregon standards, you know, right. 30, 40 years. And um, I've been at it, I have, I counted, I've done 21 vintages. And I'm lucky I've been around people who've been doing it a lot longer than me, who are a lot smarter than me. And also the advantage of, and this is interesting, I hadn't thought about this, the advantage of having those rules mm -hmm. ahead of time limits the choices you can make. So instead of it being out here, we're in here. Mm -hmm. So 
even if you make bad wine, you're going to have a semblance to that box. I hadn't thought about that. Just looked right now. That's interesting. And because there are so many choices here, there are unlimited choices, um, you're going to get, you're not going to have a voice yet for what is Oregon wine. Sure. And it takes many, many trials and errors to winnow that down to what, oh, is people, when they taste Burgundy, they go, I know Burgundy. Because it's, it's, not, limit, it's not unlimited. Um, this shared, uh, as I mentioned, I'm doing a little experiment down in, in uh, California, in Santa Barbara. Because uh, I got bored because I couldn't do anything, can't get any more land in Burgundy. Um, and made some Chardonnay and a little bit of Pinot Noir. Made it in my, in my way, within parameters. I took the, the Burgundy rules mm -hmm. and made it in our way. And it's very, very different than everything else that's made down there. Also very different than I think the wines are made here. And this is a really a te te technique, and I'm fascinated to do more of that to see what we can do. It's not Burgundy, but it's also a different style. And I think this is what's going to be fun to take this template in my mind, what I've been trained at, and apply it elsewhere. What about your your peers in Burgundy? What's the kind of when they talk about Oregon, or if they talk about Oregon, what is the sort of general sense do, that people have? The French winemakers are pretty chauvinistic. Not in this, and not in the negative sense. Just that they don't taste a lot of other wines. Um, now that said, there are a bunch of there are probably fifty to hundred that do, but that's not a lot. Um, it's the new generation have. Um, my generation started it 25 years ago by working elsewhere, tasting elsewhere, coming here to the IPNC, participating in, in, in the seminars, tasting different wines. Now their kids, my kids' age, so most of them in their late 20s, mid 30s, have usually done stages, done apprenticeships, in or done harvest in Oregon, done harvest in Australia, mm -hmm. in New Zealand, and that is what is the new wave. Um, and they appreciate it, but I think we have a really, um, my, my own taste is that I like high acid wines, not on ripe wines, high acid wines and low alcohol wines. But that's my taste. Um, we were talking earlier about, you know, someone asked me this, this, I'm getting off your question, but someone asked me this winter, you know, can you make in California and Oregon wines like Burgundy? And I said, you probably can. The more interesting question is, is there a market for those wines? Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm not sure of, because the American taste, American palate likes sugar. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get in trouble here, maybe. But likes sugar, likes richness, um, likes the alcohol, because in the mouth it makes it feel rich. And that is a American taste. We like we like things sugary. We like our we don't like we don't you know you, you'll get a someone will be a sauce and they'll put honey in it. Don't use honey. Use vinegar. It'll taste sweet if you use vinegar. And you know the taste buds work that way. That's the way I've been. But I've lived in France for 25 years. I've swallowed the Kool Aid. <laughs> sure. There are enough people in America that will get that. But maybe for a thousand cases, but not a hundred thousand cases or ten thousand cases, and I think that's really the more the more interesting question. So you know, you can be the artist and make it your way, but then can you sell it? Sure. And that's the bottom line: is the hard part is how do you sell it? Because every twelve months you have another vintage, you got another baby coming along hmm. that you got to deal with and you got to sell. So when you make wine, you get a very different attitude than when you're on the other consuming side of it. True. What about sort of your thoughts on the other big industries in the country, California, New York wine growing, you know, the Great Lakes area, uh, comparing them with Oregon or comparing them with, with Burgundy or comparing them with each other? I know nothing about wine from the East Coast. Okay. So I'm, I can't even... From Virginia, I tasted some of those wines, you know, 30 years ago, and that's that's I can't even comment on that. 
I participated in the two years ago in the Pigs and Pinot in Sonoma, and it was in, very interesting because there you have a whole nother in Hedlesburg. I think it's this this week or this weekend. Um, great, great time, great way. I mean, well-made wines and all that. But again, stylistically, very, very different than Oregon or obviously France. And um, there's a market for those wines. Not my cup of coffee. Um, glad I went, love to go back again, uh, love to participate. Um, but it's, it's uh, in most vintages in Burgundy, our flavor profile is, is not gonna win any big, big awards. But you're gonna sit, but, you're, but it's gonna, I think, please people at the table over the long term, but again, it's all a question of taste. There's no right or wrong answer. Sure. It's a question of marketing. I mean, and what is your market? I think you got to be very. Um, I'm now in my old age. I'm 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 very sanguine about. Um, you know, as I said, in California, we'll make a thousand cases. I think we can sell a thousand cases. More than that, I have my doubts. At least today. So what made you, what prompted you to, to, to the California experience? Was it just purely wanting to try something and running out of space and some oh, sunshine? Well, I'll, give, I'll give you a smart answer. The sunshine. Sunshine. <laughs> um, and actually, I have a very good friend and business partner who lives in Santa Barbara. And um, we just kind of talked in general about maybe doing some joint marketing with one of his clients who was making wine there. And went down, talked. Said, yeah, let's make a little wine. Let's do something for fun. Because I need, I need a project, and that it was kind of like, and also we actually we started by doing the Chardonnay because the people were making mostly Pinot Noir there, and so we thought let's do something, let's do Chardonnay because there's not a lot, and see if we can do something different and really make something that I want, that I personally will want to drink and share with my friends in France. That's really the challenge is can we make, it's not going to be Burgundy, it's not going to be French, but can we make something that's balanced and ripe let's say balanced, let's use, let's do, that's wine that's balanced, that we want to drink, that goes with food. That's really was, the, that's the challenge. And now we're saying, can we do that with Pinot Noir too? And as I said to the guys, my partners, if I don't like it, I'm not putting my name on it. <laughs> now I'm not ruining um, um, 20 years of busting my, my, my uh, tail because uh, for, for nine barrels of Chardonnay, it doesn't taste like I'm proud of. So, I mean, I have a very, I'm, 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 I'm being pretty exigent about that. Um, but, it's, but it's a fascinating process to go into a new area and now be able to use all these experience of 24 years of looking at the geology, looking at the hydrology, which I didn't know nothing about, the water issues, because no, virtually nothing is dry farmed. Um, looking at the plants, which we don't, the clones, which we don't focus on in Burgundy. Hmm. Um, I mean, all these different things and picking dates, you know, you're at the 34th parallel in, in, in Santa Barbara. That's very, very low. Yet it's very, very cool because of, of, of the east-west mountain range. Mm -hmm. So all these things, it's, it's taken us a year to kind of process it. And that's been fun is to use my brain again, mm -hmm. you know, rather than just sure. rather than tell people about how, how tough it's been the last seven years in Burgundy. All my friends want to cut the, slip their wrists after I start talking to them. Sure. <laughs> sure. So... Um, what is your plan going forward? Are you planning, is there a succession plan in Burgundy? Do you plan to come back to the United States? Right now I've put in place a really great young team. I have a gerant, if you will, um, uh, CEO. He's 35, he was one of my bankers. He's been with me almost three years now. He is really running the business day to day. I'm also doing a lot of the heavy lifting on the sales, going out, seeing the clients. Um, he's the age of the sommeliers and the wine buyers. Um, and then I've got um, a guy also in his 30s who's running all my vineyards. And then a, a young winemaker who, um, uh, along with Alexandre, my, my gerant, uh, who are really kind of managing the vineyard. Actually, Alexandre manages the suppliers, the outside grapes we buy in. And then Matthew, who's 25, 26, now has been with me almost three years, just got out of wine school. And the first couple of years I was there holding his hand and, and he already worked one harvest with us. Um, and I'd say he's probably be pretty much on his own this year. 
I'm very capable. I mean, um, much more capable, as I like to say, of flipping the burgers than I am. So this past year, I was in the winery, m almost always on the, on the sorting table, just kind of keeping an eye everything, but also trying to stay out of the way. And I gave a couple suggestions when I saw some grapes needed. Because I, I, I still have the eye. I, I probably, that's experience. You get eyes in the back of your head. Sure. Um, and Matthew's almost there. So um, I feel very, pr that's probably what I'm most proud of over the years. So I've had a, a, a whole, I don't know, probably had four or five very good business people and winemakers who've come through and gone on to do their own businesses. And I feel like they've learned a lot from me. They've helped me a lot to be successful. And they've gone on to be successful. So I'm proud of that. You know, it's, um, I think we have a good organization. And we, we, and we bring new people in. So do you plan to stay in Burgundy then? I'm going to be going back and forth some. Um, this project uh, with the in California is interesting. Um, also, being a dual tax citizen is complicated <laughs> and exhausting as well as expensive. Sure. Um, um, there are these basic any ex expat um, you have major major. Um, filing obligations and, um, uh, for all your bank accounts and all that. And then since I have, I basically have five or six small companies because my land, my land is, are different companies, major, t major tax return issues, long and short of it, is, might end up becoming just a U.S. tax citizen again. Well, we're looking at that. Um, but in the meantime, I'm having fun doing it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not getting out of it. Um, I've got... Uh, with with this young crew around, I'm very energized by it. Would you ever consider having a vineyard winery up here? No. Um, this new project, if it works, will be more than enough. <laughs> um, uh, also, a lot of my colleagues have already come up here, and um, I don't like to get in airplanes that much anymore. <laughs> sure. Travel. Um, I love I love where I am in. In, in France, I've got a great house, a lot of friends there. Um, I mean, that's my home. Sure. That's my home. I don't, um, we, we, we spend a lot of time in the mountains in the States in the summer because I really enjoy the, uh, uh, the Rockies and, the, and Jackson Hole. So yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see coming here. I mean, as much as I have so many good friends and all that, um, and I'm not a consultant type, I wouldn't want to consult really. Sure. Um, uh, I, I like to make something myself. If it's successful, I want to take to, to get total credit for it. <laughs> if it's if it's bad, if I gave someone some bad advice, I'd feel bad and wouldn't want to take their money. It's just it's just sure. who I am. I'm, I'm I'm I've always been an operator rather than a, a, on the consulting side. That's that's kind of who I am. So as a as an outsider, then what do you see? the future of Oregon wine looking like? What would you predict is going to happen in the next, say, 20 to 30 years? Oh, it's only going to get better. Um, I think you all have just scratched the surface. Um, there, 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 there are probably still a lot of interesting sites, um, com complex soil sites, that still can be found. Um, the real problem is going to be trying to sell the stuff. I mean, how to how to differentiate, differentiate, I can't even say it, <laughs> to make a difference, to tell the story between sure. one, one and the next. That's a more difficult question. Um, I know great wine can come out of here. Um, the issue is, is you know, how do you sell this stuff? How big is, how big do you have to be? That I don't know enough about the industry here. Um, you know, who's who's going to buy this wine? At what price? I mean, all those kinds of things. I mean, how many, someone told me yesterday, how many small virtual wineries there, there are that are making a thousand cases each, and it mm -hmm. blew my mind. A lot. I mean, it, was a, it was a lot. And, um, you know, I've been at it 20 years. I have a mailing list. And the guy I'm making the wine with has a mailing list. So I can probably sell a thousand cases direct. But if you're starting from scratch, yeah. I mean, I just just coming in this morning and, and stopping for coffee, seeing all the all the all, all the wine um, <laughs> uh, uh, tasting rooms, and it was when I came. I mean, it was about six. I guess I was here in 2000. It was almost six years ago. There are so many more than the last six years. Yeah, I think that's more of a that that's a real 
difficult. I mean, people will suck it up and, and bang at it, and you've got a lot of people. I mean, but Portland isn't huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not. It's it, it's it's not a five million person metropolis. I don't think it's a five million person metropolis. It's a couple million, yeah. and so at a certain point, you only you can't you only you only can sell so much to the locals. And um, you know, how do you get rid of it? That's the real question. I don't know. I'm not smart enough for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, all, you also mentioned the struggles in Burgundy lately. What do you see the future there looking like? We got to get some grapes. And we have the opposite problem. I mean, <laughs> it's the best of times, the worst of times. I mean, uh, we're ma we've had these, these, because we are much better viticulturists than we were 30, 40 years ago, and better winemakers than we were 34 years ago, these vintages that would have, these vintages, vintages in the past would have been a disaster. Instead, we have some fantastic wines, but no, but not enough of it, of them. There has not been a, there's not been a um, stinkhole of vintage since 09. I mean, the wines have been good. There's been not been one bad vintage. As, I mean, but, we don't have enough to, to sustain the operation. And that is a really, that's, I think about that a lot. And I don't have the answer yet. Um, I'm afraid what's gonna, well, I think, I, I know what's gonna happen is there will be some consolidation. Mm -hmm. But again, you're not talking having operations of 100 hectares, you know, 250 acres. It's just, it's an impossibility. But you will have people who are um, you know, my generation who are beginning to retire, who've been, who've worked in the vine since they're 18 years old, been in the vines for, for 40 years, 42 years, have had enough, and their kids have literally left the farm. Their kids have gone to university, are professionals, you know, don't want to come back and kill themselves. And I think it's really hard to, I mean, most of these are small family enterprises mm -hmm. of a million to maybe three million euros a year gross sales. Most of them about a million, million and a half. But the value of the lands are tens of millions of euros. And I think you're going to see more and more of these, especially the, the vineyards that are, are highly uh, valued and praised and, and sought after mm -hmm. with the, the millionaires and the billionaires coming in and buying them as they would a piece of art because they are unique. Sure. Um, Stan Kroenke came in, the billionaire yeah. uh, who you know, bought Bonard de Montre, three quarters of it. I hadn't realized that. But bought it at the end of the year. Um, and he's going to add that to Screaming Eagle and all the other stuff. And um, what's his name? Uh, Pino from um, uh, Arno from uh, LVMH bought Claude Alambre a few years ago, and that's getting jam sold through the LVMH uh, distri distribution system. Pino, um, who has Latour and bought Arroyo, I think, um, and a, one of the Rona states, um, you know, they have their own distribution system. Um, and those, those operations, they'll make money because they can distribute it through their system. They'll sure. make, they get the extra margin on it. We don't. Um, I mean, we, we, we ran some numbers when um, uh, Arno bought uh, Claude Alambre, and it was a crazy number. But we figure, even in a worst case, he can probably get his money back in about 10 or 15 years. And actually, it's probably going to be faster because they raised the prices right away, <laughs> and, and they're going to get it through all the distribution system. And that's smart business. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's going to change the face of, of some of Burgundy. I think there's still a lot of small family um, domains that will stay intact. But if the heirs want to get their money out, Mm -hmm. And also, you have the, 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 the estate tax, or the inheritance tax, that's 50%. Mm -hmm. And in France, you don't have life insurance. Life insurance is taxed as part of your inheritance. So it's an effective 25% tax or so. Because what happens in, in France, it's not your estate that's taxed. It's actually passed down, and your inheritors get taxed on it. That's why you, so these, these are the issues, is how is this going to play out? And I think there will be, a lot of it will be, 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 be subtle, a lot of the domains will probably sell their land, 
to investment groups. It'll be very quiet. Mm -hmm. And then the current domain will be, we'll release it. And I think that's the other thing people don't realize is that in all these domains, it, they're usually inner family leases. Different people might own it. Hmm. So you'll see a domain and technically you're leasing the land from a cousin or an aunt or an uncle. Interesting, okay. Okay, so um, that's the definition of the mean is you're farming everything from A to Z. It doesn't necessarily mean you own it. I mean, I have a domain of, 10 hect of 12 hectares. Um, I have third party leases and I have two land partnerships that I own a good chunk of that I lease from also. So there's all the, so it, it, it's loosey goosey. And so I think you'll find some of these, and I know what's happened is, and also people have gotten into financial trouble, mm -hmm. they've basically been gone out and sold their land and released it back. And, and so what you get a lot of Europeans, what they do is make, an small, make an a placement of their capital. So they'll, they'll buy a piece of land to hold for 50 or 100 years for their heirs. So for them, it's a tax efficient way. And this way, the, the farmer actually gets the use of the land. So you don't see these transactions. You hear about someone having trouble, but they stay in business because mm. it's done very quietly. Gotcha. Okay. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And it's interesting. What is the, is, has there been a, any kind of local reaction to the sales, to, especially to sales to, to, to Americans or to non-French? Non no, it's, uh, there's, if you look at it, there are a lot of foreigners, étrangers, étrangers, who buy land um, for or with domains for winemakers. And you know, a few years ago, this Chinese magnate from um, Macau bought the Chateau de Gevray, and there was a big polemique about it. Well. Let's, let's be honest, girls. First off, the Chateau de Gervais was a medieval building falling apart that nobody wanted to put the 10 million euros in to fix it. Most of the vines were no good, and there was a little bit of Grand Cru, and it ends up that he's a guy who collects wine, has been coming to Burgundy for years, crazy about it, and ended up leasing it back to Eric Rousseau, Domaine Rousseau. It's not like you can take the land with you. Right. So... The ownership will change, but I think the, to, the, who, the, the exploitant, basically, the tool is going to be used, the tool will be used the same, it's who owns the tool. The tool will remain the same, the person using that tool, that workman is going to be the, is going to be the same person, it's just the ownership of the tool is going to change. Okay, that makes sense. And I, I think, and so I don't think it's as dramatic as people sometimes want to make it out to be. Um, it's a shame to see that it's happening, but it's just the way it is. I don't know what you're going to do about it. Sure. Not unless the French government wants to lower the tax rate. But every government's bankrupt, so they're all looking for money. So that's not going to happen. Sure. So I think these 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 are these are the the the, the you know the, the the romantic versus the practical side that you have to be. Get honest about. What do you see as for your personal business, like your biggest challenge you foresee in the next decade, say? <laughs> well, I thought by getting to 30 acres, I was going to be, be able to get out of the negotiant business um, and have enough grapes. I think you have enough critical mass. I think, I think what's going to happen unless you are a billionaire and buy something for the fun of it, um, because it is for the fun of it, it's the prestige of it, it's, mm -hmm. the col it's collecting. Sure. Um, to have a business like mine that really is a business, I need to get bigger. Um, I need another four to six hectares. I need another good... 10 acres to spread my costs around. Um, I also need to um, get a different mix of vineyards because the Bourgogne vineyards, the least expensive vineyards, the least expensive wines cost as much or more to farm than the Grand Cruz. <laughs> There's no difference in price of what it costs. If anything, it's more. 
So I need to basically shake and bake and trade and get rid of some of these less paying, less less good vineyards mm -hmm. and get get something instead of getting ten ten dollars, ten euros a bottle for that I can sell for ten or 15, 15 or or sixteen euros a bottle for. It's the same amount of work. And um, that is really my challenge right now is trying to find trying to get a better mix and get bigger. It's two things. Get them different mix and get bigger to cover that cost. What about do you foresee uh, sales marketing being more of an issue than it has been? Do you see it getting easier? It's always difficult, but we have now after 20 years, people know us, and I could probably sell 50% more than I'm making. I mean, there are markets, we could still expand markets in the US a bit. There are a couple, two or three markets we could be in if we had the wine. And in, you know, it's not worth it going to these markets if all I can sell is 50 cases. I need two, three hundred cases. Even that, that's small potatoes by anybody else's <laughs> standpoint. But for us, you know, all of a sudden, you know, two or three times, that's close to a thousand cases. Right. So I need another thousand cases. If I had another thousand cases, then I could sell more in the United States. Um, elsewhere in the world, um, Asia is still growing. That's, that's the future. Mm -hmm. um, China is, is, I think, is, is overrated. Um, it's too hard to get into. Um, everybody wants just the, the high-end wines, the ones that everybody, um, the collectible wines. Mm -hmm. um, but long term, um, we were talking about this morning, is, is, is we, my goal is to deliver wines that I can sell to the importers for around 15, under 20 euros a bottle. Because if I sell it for 20, it becomes 60 bucks. If I sell for 10, it's 30 bucks. It's about a triple. Hmm two and a half to a triple. And we're at the wrong end of the food chain. So um, I've got to figure out a way to, for the same amount of work, get a better margin. And that's through the mix of the, of, of the vineyards. Sure. So what advice would you have, would you give someone who was looking to either enter the wine industry from scratch, or maybe perhaps getting into inter international distribution, or someone entering the industry at a young age? I always say, go work in a wine store, go work in a wine bar, or go work for a distributor, because they'll pay you to learn. And you'll taste. And the, the key, you know, we were talking at lunch about this, the difference between marketing, which is Procter & Gamble and soap and big brands, that's different than sales. If you love wine, and want to sell wine and get involved in the different prop, pop, pop, and all aspects of wine, you got to taste wine. You got to taste, you got to taste, you got to taste to know what you like, what you don't like, and then know how to sell it and who to sell it to. And the only way to do that is work in a retailer, work at a wine bar, work for a distributor. I always say to people, start as a part-time person in a retail store. You'll then see Bottles will be open, you'll taste the bottles, you'll meet the customers, you'll hear things, you'll learn the language of wine. And from that, that's what I did. And I never thought I'd be making wine. I never <laughs> thought I'd be sitting here, you know, 25 years later, he, he, here in, in Oregon, talking about it. No way in the world. <laughs> no way in the world. True. So that's, I think that's it. Um, you got to work at it. You got you you to work. <laughs> Get to work in it. Well, that's all the questions we have okay. for you. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention or that I should have asked you? No, th thank you very much. It's great to be here and uh, great to be back in, in Oregon with my friends. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your time. We really You're appreciate welcome. it.